And now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's very special guest speaker. Jennifer Olette is a science writer, a very successful science writer. She has three wonderful and popular books. She writes on the intersection between science and popular culture. She's a prolific blogger, blogs for Discover News and Scientific American. She has recently been on the Craig Ferguson show, the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, a uh, wonderful YouTube clip uh, showing her talking about her book, and it's this book that she's going to share more about with us tonight. This is The Calculus Diaries, Ma How Math Can Help You Lose Weight, Win at Vegas, and Survive a Zombie Apocalypse. Please welcome Jennifer Ouellette. Oh, I'm so impressed to see this many people here. I will just start out by saying that my high school math teacher is having a very, very good laugh these days because I was that obnoxious kid in his class who was going, this is boring, do I really have to know this? What good am I, what, when am I ever gonna use this in real life? And he kept trying to tell me and the rest of the students in the class that math was important, blah, 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 blah. But we get this idea that there are two kinds of people, the non-math people and the math people, and you can only be one or the other, and if you're a non-math person and you, like me, go on to earn a degree in English literature, you know, your motto is, this is an actual t-shirt that I had in college, I'm an English major, you do the math. <laughs> but of course, that's a very, very limited viewpoint, and I, I actually am very grateful for the fact that as an adult, after I got out of college, after I'd started a career, or was trying to start a career as a writer, I ended up writing about physics. And as part of that, I ended up having to really come to terms with the fact that I hated math. And I had to really come to terms with the fact that I was not as bad at it as I thought I was. <laughs> And that was a really tremendous thing. When I started talking to physicists and interviewing them and talking to mathematicians, I realized that it, their knowledge of math meant that they could see things in the world that I couldn't see. This little cartoon here, I think, really captures it. There's how we see the world. We can look at a pretty sunset, as I did with my, you know, re my then fiancé before we got married. We were driving along uh, a nice little beach. We stopped to look at a sunset. And I was admiring the beautiful sunset, and he looked out at the sunset and thought, and said, wouldn't it be great to take a Fourier transform of those waves? <laughs> now, <laughs> a Fourier transform is essentially a mathematical function. It's a calculus thing where you take a wavelength or a, a, a compound wave of light, you break it down into its component frequencies. It's, it's used everywhere in, in digital processing. You know, every time you like listen to music or whatever, you're actually somewhere, somewhere a Fourier transform is being done. But he looked out at that scene and he saw things that I did not. And that made me realize that maybe it was time to once and for all face down the calculus monster. And when I did, I was expecting this big scary thing because we've seen those textbooks, they're like this. Calculus is about change in motion. That's it. Um, it's the tool that we use to describe things in the physical world that are changing and moving. So. Let me tell you why it's important to know that underlying layer. Because you know you could say, well, don't you know, don't harsh my mellow, man. I'm enjoying the sunset. I don't want to hear about the math. I don't care about the frequencies that make up those pretty wavelengths. Um, math, if you know the math, it can help you see things that are, that might be counterintuitive. And the best example of this is something that I think that most of us learn uh, in high school, which is that objects fall at the same rate regardless of math. Now. Sorry, regardless of mass. Now, we all memorize this. We all accept it because we're taught it by our teachers. But when I started, you know, writing about physics and hanging out with physicists, I said, you know, I've always wondered about this. I asked a physicist friend of mine. I, I believe that this is true because I've seen demonstrations and things in a vacuum. I said, but how did they figure out that was true? I mean, we didn't actually even know how to create a vacuum when this equation was first developed. And he said, I'm glad you asked that. He goes, it's going to require a little bit of math. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> no, no, that's OK. I don't need to know that bad. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's OK. It's not real math. It's just algebra. Because that's, <laughs> that's how physicists think. <laughs> and uh, he walked me through the equation. And he was right. It, A was not nearly as scary. And once he explained what all the symbols meant, he said, look, here's the big M. That's the mass of the Earth. And then we have these little Ms for the masses of the two objects. 
and he walked me through the derivation, and the little m's canceled out, and you end up with that. You know, the mass of the object is irrelevant to the calculation. So people like Galileo saw that, did that calculation, and said it shouldn't matter. And all that, what we see with our eyes is actually not what the reality is. And they were right. So that's why you should care about that. The other thing is, I always approach these things through history. I certainly learned about physics that way, and I decided that was a good way to learn about math, and there's a reason for that. Um, because science builds on everything that came before. If you want to understand a piece of modern-day science, there's 200, 1,000 years of history that went into coming up with that piece of science. So I figured that a good place to start, calculus. And that took me not just 500 years back, but all the way back to Archimedes. Um, he was one of the predominant uh, thinkers in Syracuse. He was an, an ingenious engineer. Um, the ruler of Syracuse actually had him in charge of the defenses against the invading Roman army. But he was fascinated by the problem of curves. This was at a time when they were pretty good with geometry. The, the ancient Greeks kind of knew their geometry. They, if you had something regular, like a perfect triangle, or a circle even, or a nice square, or a rectangle, they could figure out the area. We all learned these in junior high or high school. This is, this is easy, easy stuff. But what happens if you have something that's a parabola? It's not a perfect circle, or a perfect rectangle, or a triangle. What if it's this big, messy wave thing? How do you figure out the area under that curve? And they came up with a method using, say, a triangle, um, where he would basically draw a big triangle. You can kind of see the outlines of it there. And he would figure out the area of that triangle, and he'd put that off to one side. And then he'd draw a couple of smaller triangles in the remaining space, figure out that area, put it off onto the side, and he'd add all those up, many, many triangles, always smaller and smaller each time. And essentially, the idea was that the more little triangles you got, the smaller the triangles got, the better your approximation would be to the area to the curve. And they called this the method of exhaustion for good reason. <laughs> but he was this close to inventing integral calculus, and he didn't know it. Um, now, we care about parabolas because, among other things, it, I think you will see it's going to come up a lot in the course of this talk, which is why I'm bringing it up now. Um, this is, again, this notion of things being hidden under the surface, these underlying connections, things that seem completely different are actually described by the same mathematics, and the parabola shows up over and over and over again. It's, you're going to become very familiar with this. And one of the things that Archimedes came up with was this idea of a death ray. He basically had this curved mirror in the shape of a parabola, the idea that it would capture sunlight, redirect it, the heat and light, and he could use it to burn the invading ships in the harbor. Uh, the Mythbusters famously tried to recreate this experiment, and they did, on their second attempt, manage with great you know, effort to at least get a small fire burning on one of the ships. Um, they concluded that probably it was very inefficient, even if it was possible, and you'd be better off shooting flaming arrows. Um, there is a real-world equivalent. This is the Vidara Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. Someone did not do their math when they were designing this hotel. It is a, a sheer glass reflective surface. It's curved. It's in this nice parabolic curve uh, shape to it. And it turns out it gets really hot in Vegas in the summer, 112 degrees. The sun hits this one sweet spot, directs right down to the pool area. It became front page news in Vegas because this lawyer from out of town was sitting in the deck chair. And suddenly it just started getting really warm. And then he realized that the hair on the back of his neck was burning. And he got up and he, he, he panicked and he went to like tell the bartender, he goes, oh yeah, we call that the death spot. <laughs> it actually melted the plastic uh, on, a, on the newspaper there. So, you know, math can hurt you. I mentioned that Archimedes was this close to inventing integral calculus, and he might have done it, except that even, even his ingenuity could not keep off the invading Romans for long. They sacked Syracuse, um, and whoops, they killed him. <laughs> the greatest mathematical mind in Western civilization essentially was trying to finish drawing, uh, a little drawing in the sand, and a soldier got impatient with him and just cleft his head in two. So we did not get integral calculus. Calculus would end up not being invented for another 1,600 years. Um, 
it was funny, a friend of mine said that that was, the, the, unfortunately, the Romans' great contribu contribution to mathematics was killing the greatest mathematical mind. So, <laughs> and you actually did see it in the intellectual development. The focus of math and science at that point switched over to the Arab world. And we did, in fact, you know, around, you know, 1100 or so, have the invention of algebra. Those of you who have taken algebra and hated it as much as I did, because I was just bored silly, we learned to hate this guy. But when I started really reading about him, I realized that algebra initially did not have all those scary symbols. It was essentially sentences, it was words, it was a logical argument they were, that, that he was constructing, and he was using this, this means as a way of doing it, but he did it with words. And eventually people figured out that, you know, you didn't have to say the artist formerly known as Prince, you could use a little funny symbol, and everybody would know what that meant. <laughs> And it would just make it much easier to manipulate the symbols and you could end up figuring out logical inconsistencies that much better. You could get both sides to balance. It ended up just being a much more efficient means of doing that. So now we have algebra and we have geometry. We really want to bring those two together. And that is when we get to Fermat and Descartes. Uh, they are the two that independently of each other, kind of around the same time, figured out that geometry and algebra were essentially two different ways of looking at the same thing. Algebra is the more abstract, symbolic way of looking at it, and if you want to see what a mathematical function looks like, you plot it out onto this Cartesian graph. It merges the two, and when you merge the two, it, it ends up being kind of a powerful thing. It, it's often said that there are two kinds of mathematical minds. There's the abstract algebraic thinker and the geomet geometrical thinker, the one who thinks more in pictures. That's still true. It's very rare to find a professional mathematician who can do both. I remember watching a, a couple of physics talks, and it was very clear that one of the professors, a man, a physicist, a man, was um, very much a visual geometric thinker, and the other one, um, the woman, was definitely an algebraic person. When she was talking about a black hole, she was writing the equation, and he was drawing pictures. And either way is a perfectly valid way of thinking of the same thing. But um, by bringing those two together, you pave the way for calculus, because a geometric curve is static, but the world is not a static place. So when we start thinking about the physics of the world, when we start thinking about the world as it actually is, we want to be able to describe the world as it changes, as it moves, and that is where calculus came in, and that is, was Isaac Newton's greatest genius. He's the one who realized, hey, a parabolic curve, which seems sort of still and static in geometry, is actually a thing of beauty. It actually describes movement. An apple falling from the tree, for example. Or planets in elliptical orbits. While I was writing the calculus diaries, um, obviously I had to go back and learn you know, some very rudimentary calculus and also review algebra and trigonometry because it had been a very long time. Um, we would often find ourselves in the living room in the evening and I was doing my little baby calculus and he'd be working on his big fancy physics papers. And there was one point where I asked him a question, he goes, oh, it's funny, I actually just used that in my calculation. And I went, but this is baby calculus, and you're like a big, smart, professional physicist. And he went, same tool. It's part of a bigger calculation, but that little piece, that little tool is something that is used over and over again. So it was, it was a lesson to me not to put down what I was doing, that in fact, professional physicists still use even these fundamental things. They use it 